Hello and welcome to The Extras, where we take you behind the scenes of your favorite TV shows, movies, and animation, and their release on digital, DVD, Blu-ray, and 4K, or your favorite streaming site. I'm Tim Millard, your host. As many of you know, Warner Brothers is celebrating its 100th year anniversary this year, and we have had quite a few podcasts celebrating this centennial. And today we are kind of going to cap off the celebration with a lively discussion about the men behind the studio with author Chris Yogurst who has a brand new book out called The Warner Brothers. Chris has previously written two books on Hollywood, and his work has appeared in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Review of Books, the Journal of American Culture, and the Hollywood Reporter. And joining us is a friend of the podcast, Alan K. Rohde, author of the fantastic book Michael Curtiz, A Life in Film, and his recent book Blood on the Moon, which just came out this uh, last spring. It's a lively discussion, so I think you'll really enjoy it. Chris, Alan, it's good to have you guys on the podcast today. Thank you. Great to be back with you, Tim, and it's great to be back with Chris because we were just at Larry Edmonds a couple days ago talking about uh, those Warner Brothers, and here we are going to do it again. <laughs> so looking forward. Absolutely. Well, Chris, before we dive into the discussion of your new book, I did read in the acknowledgments that you actually were on the Warner Archive podcast a few years back discussing your other Warner Brothers book from, uh, I guess it's titled From the Headlines to Hollywood, The Birth and Boom yep. of Warner Brothers. And it, it said in there, you're, you've been a fan of the Warner Archive for quite some time. So uh, tell us a little bit about that experience. Oh, that was great. I mean, I was connected to Matt Patterson many years ago through a, a mutual friend of ours. And and um, he, he was at Larry Edmonds with us uh, the other night. And, um, yeah, he, he was the one who, you know, when I was w first working on Warner brothers, you know, I was able to come onto the lot and, you know, kind of, you know, feel that history, you know, just coming off the walls seemingly around every corner. Um, but that book was an extended version of my dissertation, uh, that I was planning on, on writing into a book. I was focused on the thirties and how Warner brothers really, we always hear about how they ripped from the headlines. So I wanted to focus on exactly that and how they did that. Cause I just think it's a really cool part of history. Um, but yeah, and it was a perfect timing because when I was working on that, you had the Warner Archive guys and the podcast and all these new movies coming out that were hard to find. So it was really, you know, by the time in my life where I was starting to get really serious about writing and researching about Warner Brothers and not just being a fan, I had all this access to information and, and it was and, and physical discs that, you know, you couldn't get you know, stream anywhere. So it was just it was. I, yeah, I am. Um, I I am a, a huge fan, and um, also it really helps my research. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you mentioned George, and and uh, I'm sure that they had a great time with you. I might have to go through and look for that podcast so I can listen to it again. I probably have the link somewhere. I'm actually going to be doing a talk with George at the Burbank Public Library in November. Oh, you are. All right. Well, yeah. I'll have to. Uh, I, I did that. I did that when Curtis came out, and one of the things I loved about the Burbank Library, it's a beautiful library, is that the audience was all industry people, and a lot yeah. of them were Warner Brothers people. Uh, so um, That's what they told me. They, they have that draw, yeah, and they it, connect to the uh, studio and bring it, them in. It, you, you don't get the you know garden variety type of questions. You get very, very insightful questions and... Uh, connections with Warner Brothers with the industry, so it's it's a great place to do that. And, and, and you probably get better than that. George. <laughs> yeah, and you probably get. I mean, you probably had this happen too with your book. I mean, since my my latest book came out, I've been getting emails from people that were connected, like Saul Polito, the cinematographer. His grandson reached out to me yesterday. I got an email from uh, I think the grandson of Dean Jennings, who co-wrote Jack Warner's memoir. Um, if we can call it that, and <laughs> we we talked yeah. about um, <laughs> the pros and cons of that book, um, yeah. yeah, it's 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 amazing what all comes out of the woodwork once you put your work out there. And Abs you know, absolutely, I remember um, I've had a, a fellow in Israel whose father worked with Curtiz uh, at Sasha Films and Moon of Israel uh, in the early twenties before he came to America and sent me all these pictures of Curtiz on the set. Uh, I bumped into someone who lived in Curtiz's old house here in what is now Woodland Hills. Uh, uh, some guy came up to me at a signing, I think at the Billy Wilder theater. Oh, Curtiz's younger brother used to rent our house and he left all these photos, you know, and, and of course you're delighted to hear this. 
Although when you hear all these stories, you say it's too late. The book's published. Right. <laughs> no. But at any rate. Yeah. Uh, I, the, um, the best one is I got uh, Tom Doherty got me in touch with um, Greg Orr, who's Jack Warner's grandson or step grandson. And, right. and he read the book and I, I got just in time for him to get a blurb uh, on the inside cover. <laughs> So right, yeah. Well, I I do have to I do have to compliment our publisher who published your fine book and published Michael Curtiz, uh, University of Kentucky Press, because when they wanted to put Curtiz out in paperback, by that time I had gotten to know Michael Curtiz's grand niece, and she told me some family stories, particularly with regard to what happened to members of Michael Curtiz's family during the Holocaust mm. and how his sister. Uh, who was the grandmother of uh, Aggie, the grandniece who who befriended me, how she survived Auschwitz. And it's a compelling, compelling, heart-rending story. So I, I said, Kentucky, I really need to write an afterword for the new edition with all this, this story. And they said, of course. So I was able to do that. And I was very grateful that they let me do that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I will be doing with everything that's already happened in the last two months. I'm going to be doing something similar, you know, in a year or two when right. the paperback comes out. Um, but it's good to know about your book because I know I'm, I'm back in November. So when I when I go back to visit our mutual friend, David K, I'll pick up a signed copy at his at his shop. Of oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. David. And, and we did recently have Greg uh, on the podcast to talk about he's releasing re-releasing, I should say, with an update to his documentary about his grandfather. And so that was fun. And then he, he mentioned you and then I said, Oh yeah, I've already connected with Chris on Facebook. Yep. And we did a, we did an interview that's on his, it's a bonus feature on his disc. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Right. So, Hey, it's a small circle. We all love yep. Warner brothers. We're all big fans of the history of the studio. And uh, that kind of leads me to the next question I had, which is you had written the earlier book, but what's the story kind of of, Hey, I decided to do one about not Warner brothers, the studio, but the Warner brothers yeah so each each book i've done has led into the next one so and i, I feel like that's going to continue but i you know so i did the one about the studio in the 30s and during that research i discovered harry warner's defense of hollywood uh when the senate came after hollywood for making anti-nazi movies and that led to the book about writing a book called hollywood hates hitler about this senate investigation um and then going back through harry again with that book, I'm, I was thinking, I got to write a book about Harry Warner because, you know, everyone, you know, Jack is like the Warner brother. Right. But it's like it was the Warner brothers. There was four of them. There was a lot of brothers and sisters, but it was four that mm -hmm. that focused on on the studio. So I really wanted to focus on Harry. And then I was saying before we started recording, I was telling Alan, our mutual friend, Pat McGilligan, who's also a fantastic biographer in his own right, uh, suggested that I take on all of the brothers. Uh, because not enough people will know Harry necessarily by name, but even people who don't know Hollywood history, a bell rings when they hear Warner Brothers. So maybe focus on all of them. And that gave me the opportunity to focus on the the brothers and not just the studio. You know, so many so many books about Warner Brothers is about the stars, the movies, and then the actual brothers who founded the studio kind of take a back seat as supporting characters. And I wanted to write a book where they were the main characters and all of the studio drama and the actors and the talent and all of this were, were the supporting characters. You know, I, Chris, you're absolutely right. And I think one of the fascinating things about the Warner Brothers, it's, it's kind of like the Warner Brothers were the longest running reality show in Hollywood because the For family sure. dynamics was something right out of a movie like House of Strangers or Broken Lance. I mean, Harry, the, 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 the conflict between the older brother, Harry, and Jack Warner, the kid brother, Sam holding them together, uh, all of that dynamics. And then, of course, uh, near the end in the 50s, the ultimate betrayal by Jack, what happened with his son, um, you know, it's, it's really something when your closest friend is your masseur who shows up at your funeral, uh, it, 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 the, the dynamics of the, of the whole Warners, uh, as a family is, I find so fascinating and could be a movie in and out of, of itself. Absolutely. I mean, it's the, the drama within the family. I mean, I mean, it's got everything, right? You know, you've got the immigrant rags to riches story, right? But then within that, you have all of this. 
and even more stuff that really isn't in a lot of the other books. I mean, the you know what this family went through. I mean, Harry you know, priming his son, Lewis, to become this big player at Warner Brothers. And then he dies um, in like 1932 or 33. And, you know, and they had just lost Sam a few years prior. And it's it's just, it was it was really heart-wrenching. Right. And, and Sam through. dies the day or the night before his greatest triumph premieres, The Jazz Singer. I mean, tell me that isn't a script made in Hollywood. I Absolutely. Mean, the, you can't the, make, you can't write it better than that. Yeah, the the tragedy uh, uh, of the family, and yet this this striving to succeed. That I think, as you pointed out, the the immigrant up from their bootstraps story. But I think what also bound them together was the anti semitism that went back to when their father was was you know where they were ducking uh, uh, pogroms and Cossacks. Mm-hmm. And, and possibly being killed and coming to this country. And then the failed businesses of their father, the humiliations. And I think it, particularly in the beginning, regardless of the differences between like Jack and Harry, it was the Warner Brothers against the world. And they were shoulder to shoulder that they were going to make good. Uh, and it, it turned no out to be what. the movie industry. And, and they were going to make good no matter what. Yeah, because there was a ton of it. I tried to chronicle in the book. I, every every mention of a possible other business they ran, I tried to put in the book. You know, it's everything. I mean, a lot of books have Ben Warner's uh, shoe repair shop, right? But it's like they had grocery stores, butcher shops, bowling alleys, bicycle shop, bike <laughs> bike shops. I, I think yeah. there was mention of of an ice cream shop and somebody in yeah. in the. Somebody from their hometown was writing. Esther Hamilton was her name, and she was she was covering a lot of them as like hometown heroes. And I think in one of her, I couldn't. This is the only place I've seen it, so I don't know if it's confirmed. But they, mm-hmm. I think she even made a claim that they. What was it? It was the the some some ice cream invention. I don't know what it was. I can't remember what it was. No, but it was like they were mm-hmm. they were on top of trying you know trying to trend set with every single product they mm-hmm. had. Right. And then movies come along and then they end up doing that. But the difference with that one is every time they fail in it, they go back to it again and they come back, you know, with with that knowledge and to do something else. Right. You know, they're in exhibition right. then they're in distribution, then they're in production. And along the way, you know, they have successes and failures. Thomas Edison shuts them down. They come back again, uh, you know, eventually move away from the east and go out west. Uh, mm-hmm. And yeah, every time they come back stronger and that comp- that that is straight from, like Alan said, that's straight from their their parents' experiences. Uh, and that was instilled in all of the brothers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the things, as you pointed out, Jack was kind of the public face of the company because he was, you know, as it said, under the shield in charge production. <laughs> You know, this this like Ben Hur grabbing the chariot reins, you know, Jack Jack yep. always had to be strong. But Harry was the fellow that bought all the theaters that that uh, connected with Motley Flint and the Security Pacific Bank when banks weren't lending money, particularly to Jewish uh, uh, studio executives that were just starting out in the 20s and so on and so forth. And Harry was the one that really built the vertically integrated company. Uh, right. And then when Warner Brothers bought First National in 1929, that was like the flea swallowing the elephant. I think um, the head of Paramount at the time said, I, I thought it was going to be First National buying Warner Brothers. Uh, right. So, you know, I, I think one of the things, I, the good things I think that your book does is that it gives Harry his due as the guy that really from a corporate business sense built the company while Jack and and Sam was involved in making the movies and doing the technological innovations, Harry was building the company that made it all possible. He was, he was. And and you mentioned Motley Flint, right? That's another tragedy that, that came to the Warner brothers because here's this guy, right? Who was, he's this virtuous, right? He's lending to Jews, you know, there, you know when, when that was not a popular thing to do, but then also here's this guy who was, who was uh, uh, caught up in the teapot dome scandal and it ended up getting murdered in court. Uh, yeah, and there it, was a, uh, there was a scandal in LA during the boom oil years. And there was some, very complicated scandal that I read a book about, and they had something called the bottomless oil well. And somehow Motley Flint was somehow, I don't know whether he was 
directly involved or peripherally involved because his bank lent some notes. But you're right. He was in a courtroom and some some guy that was unhinged who had been ruined financially brought a gun into the courtroom and killed him in, in, during a trial. Uh, right. And uh, and that was one of Jack Warner's a few close friends. Yep. Uh, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And they and said early 30s. Mot- but- yeah. I always thought the name Motley Flint was a W.C. Fields invention. <laughs> it sounds like one of W.C. Yeah. Fields name, but it was a real person totally. and it was a tragedy. Yeah. I, I, I will, I'm glad you guys mentioned Motley Flint because when I was reading and I, I think that, you know, going back to Harry, he was the older brother. Jack was still pretty young in those early days that made sure that the company didn't get swallowed up by the other other uh, mm-hmm. uh, companies. And basically by the sheer force of, of nature of their personality and their, their brotherhood, they pushed through and they fought through all of the lawsuits and all of the, uh, it sounded like they had a lot of people, you know, being pretty negative about them too uh, in those early mm-hmm. days. And they just said, okay, you know, we are the small one, but we're going to make this work. And, uh, but, but behind the scenes, what I wouldn't know if I didn't read the book is how important a, a character like Motley Flint is in the story because mm-hmm. they needed that money. They needed that access. Yeah. Without that, they're not able to do what they do. They're not able to expand. Yeah. They're not able to do their, uh, you know, of various different companies. Because you mentioned that they they ran many companies within that, that Warner Brothers umbrella as they kept expanding and kept pushing forward and expanding. And uh, so I thought that was a really interesting yeah. uh, part of the story. Yeah, I think Harry was one of the first people that brought Wall Street money, bank money into the film industry. Right. Because yeah. there were a lot of companies like Warner Brothers in the early 20s and going back to the teens that were, you know, would just set up shop in Hollywood. And, you know, they were kind of operating on the seat of their pants. And it was kind of the only the strong survive, you know, the Warners, the Cones, people like that. Uh, but the thing that I respect about them is movies were their business and they cared about what their name went on. You know, I always remember uh, Bill Wellman Jr. telling me about how his father made the Oxbow incident and he took it to Zanuck and Zanuck said, uh, I'll make it. I'll produce it. It won't make a dime, but I want my name on it. But of course, Bill Wellman, you got to make three other pictures for me, for, for me to do this. You know, he drove that hard bargain. But these guys cared about movies. They weren't part of Ivy League graduate corporations trying to run everything with an Excel spreadsheet. And I'll let the audience draw their conclusions from that. But uh, uh, they, 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 cared, they cared about their product. And particularly Harry and... and Uh, Chris Brearley brings this out really well in his book. Harry believed motion pictures were virtuous in that they could uplift and educate Americans about their country, about the freedoms, about everything with in the series of films they did and documentaries on America. And more than that, the charitable stuff that he did. And and a lot of that uh, people aren't even aware of. Um, and, and I really think that Chris did a great service in bringing out what Harry Warner stood for. Uh, you know, he, he stood for a lot of things that were good and that were virtuous. Of course, he didn't, he didn't believe in unions, (laughs) you know, uh, but, but I, I don't think a lot of people who came up during his time did that. And he, that has, the union thing had to be kind of force fed to them. Uh, as oh, it yeah, did that was that was they were they're they were just in line with the studio you know you know with that era exactly. you know exactly. you know all the other studio had stance but yeah Harry yeah what what was interesting about him in, is that you know the more I learned about him the more I just it solidified how there, it was never really preachy he, nothing was phony about it right he truly wanted to you know for every big public speech he would do he would also get everybody together in an afternoon on the lot. And talk mm-hmm. with them about the news of the day and what was going on and what he's learned um, so that everybody would would be informed and have this on the back of their mind while they were making movies for the public good. And that's right. something that I feel like was a real top down influence. And of course, I mean, we can't you mentioned, right. Alan, you mentioned Zanuck before. Right. There was also major producers that weren't Warner Brothers like Zanuck and Hal Wallace. 
that really also took this mentality and really perfected it. And in Zanuck, you can yeah, see this well, when you go to Fox, right? He's he's making movies that could have been Warner Brothers movies. Oh, yeah. Well, Zanuck, uh, Zanuck uh, with all due respect to the brothers, Zanuck really founded the Warner Brothers brand during the 1930s. The, the musicals, the rip from the headlines, the crime, all of that. I mean, they even ventured a little bit into horror movies uh, when studios were going bankrupt and theaters were closing and they were having dish nights and everything like that. Although Jack Warner, uh, he, he disliked horror movies and he hated movies about alcoholics. Uh, uh, I remember towards the end of his career when they were making, uh, uh, Blake Edwards was making The Days of Wine and Roses. And he says, why do we want to make a movie about a couple of drunks? You know, he, he, you know, he did, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't get that, you know, he didn't get that part of the drama, but uh, Warner brothers were, were the brothers were technical innovators in the late twenties and the 1930s, uh, you know, with the two strip technical sound, of course, and the jazz singer. And as you pointed out, Chris, Sam Warner and the Warners weren't the first people to work on sound, but they were the ones that took it and made it what it became uh, with, with, uh, with the Vitagraph on disc uh, sound system. Yeah. They could bring it to market. And that was even while Thomas Edison was talking trash in the press about it, you know, and saying, Oh, that'll never work. I couldn't get it to work. And if I, Thomas Edison couldn't get it to work, these, you know, these kids won't be able to get it to work. And of course they do. Um, but Jack, another thing that comes to mind, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, why you want to make a movie about a couple of drunks. You know, Jack also, all of the brothers, but for the purpose of this story, Jack was really good at reading the room, reading the culture, knowing what was, you know, what was on people's minds. And he he was he actually defended the industry and his studio in the 50s during the juvenile delinquency hearings. Um, mm-hmm. And Senator Kefauer, who had just went after the mob, is now going after movies. Um, and he gets all kinds of stuff wrong about which movies were Warner Brothers movies. And then he's, he claims to have seen Rebel Without a Cause. And Jack's like, it's not even done yet. Um, he's like, <laughs> I haven't seen it. Um, but then somebody, um, it's kind of weird. Never, in the never underestimate somebody... the stupidity of politicians. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And somebody starts hammering against Warner's Warner for making movies where there's like smoking and drinking in it and stuff. And this is by now the late 50s. And he claps back by saying, you know, you only drink water where you come from or what? Like that's, you know, it's basically like this is, you know, prohibition was decades ago now. So like we are here yeah. today. So he was. Yeah, well, by was, the, I, I agree. And by the 50s, you know, the studios were shedding the tether of a 1930 production code that had gone uh, out of fashion, like the buggy whip and women's <laughs> wearing staves. I mean, it was. By that time, and I think Joe Breen finally retired and, and limped off the stage in 1954 with his Oscar. And um, it, it was at the 50s were a time of change. And I think uh, Jack Warner and the Warners realized that, you know, in 1951, if memory serves, Warner was Warner's was the most profitable studio because Jack got rid of the got rid of the entire story department. And laid off these people because they realized the days of the assembly line and having the theaters after the antitrust verdict had come in and they had to divest. They realized that the movie industry changed and they were going to change. They had to change with it. And I think Jack got out ahead of that. The thing that he didn't get out ahead of was television. He fought television initially. He wouldn't have a TV set on the lot. He gave these interviews, which look really obtuse upon retrospective viewing that television is a fad and it's going to go away and everything. But then uh, he hired his son-in-law, Bill Orr, to run the television arm, uh, I think, in like the mid 50s, like starting mm-hmm. in 55. And and he he had to he, it took him a while to come to terms with television, I guess. It did. And Harry he saw it. value in it. I, I found that Harry tried to buy a couple television stations and this was right after the antitrust stuff and they shut that down. But his only re- but his reasoning for it wasn't to produce new content. It was just another way to show your movies and seeing like, right. well, here's another stream right. of places we can put our movies. If people are going to have TVs right. in their living rooms, well, if they're not going, if they're going to, I mean, he could see ahead that, all right, if we're going to start having issues with theaters, 
why don't we just put the movies where they are? Yeah, unfortunate that didn't happen because the person that really did that was Lou Wasserman when uh, MCA had Universal and he bought almost the entire Paramount library and made uh, how many billions have they made uh, as Universal made off of that library. So, yeah, I think I think Harry was a very astute businessman. There's no doubt about that. He was. He, he saw all that. But of course, by, by around 1950, I mean, he's the oldest brother. He's already thinking about retirement. Right. I mean, so he didn't really have the mm-hmm. legs to to get into this and see it through. But it, but yeah, right. it is worth noting that he, you know, he as one of the, the industry founders, you know, he, he even by that time, you know, several mm-hmm. decades in the business, he could still see a way to maneuver with the changing times. Right. And, and I think one, one of the other things that's become more well known now, uh, but the, that you wrote about was uh, how Harry and the brothers recognized the threat of Nazism and did something about it and reacted to it in the 1930s. And, you know, it, it, as late as 1939, MGM was giving tours to staffers that worked for Joseph Goebbels in Germany because they didn't want to give up the German market. And, and uh, uh, things didn't change until, until war broke out in Europe in, uh, in 39, late 39. But uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think Harry wanted to make a movie about a concentration camp in like 1934, 1935, and Joe Breen, Mayer, and the other moguls just shut that idea down right away. Is that is that accurate? Um, that that sounds that sounds right. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember specifics, but right, but this is also why, right? Yeah, they were the first to pull out of Germany their product out of Germany in 33, so they were the first to give up profits for what mm-hmm. they felt was right, which is a perfect mm-hmm. Warner Brothers thing to do. But then they started making these out, right? Because you had the production code, right? You, which you mentioned, which one of the strictures was you couldn't go, you couldn't you know, attack other nations. So this is tricky right. when you have the Nazis. It's like, yeah, we should attack them, but the rules say we can't attack other nations. So they started making these allegorical anti Nazi movies, stuff like Black Legion mm-hmm. and They Won't Forget and The Life of Emil Zola and all these movies that are really anybody living at the time would have seen these as very, mm-hmm. very kind of blatant anti-authoritarian movies and anyone right. who's watching and those the movies pa- and reading the, the news. The patriotic short movies that he also made, uh, uh, basically pumping up Americanism and democracy and, and our way of life right. with kind of a compare and contrast to what was yep. going on in Europe. So And and, yeah. right, and they were doing this before before it was cool, right? Before, you know, as soon as yeah. World War II right. broke out, the Office of War Information goes to Hollywood and, you know, it's like, oh, how can you help? Um, but the yeah. Warner Brothers had essentially been doing this kind of stuff and thinking about it since 1933. Yeah. And and as you wrote in your Hollywood Hate, Hates Hitler book, uh, the the studio chiefs, including the Warners, got raked, attempted to be raked over the coals by these isolationist Republican senators uh, because roughly half or maybe 45 percent of the country wanted nothing to do with any wars or anything in Europe, didn't want to support England and so forth. I mean, Roosevelt, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president, had to do a lot of things by stealth uh, initially yeah. uh, to, to support uh, England when England was was standing alone against the Nazis. So uh, uh, th- when they started making movies like in 1941, uh, everyone brings up uh, Confessions of a Nazi Spy, and that was certainly controversial, groundbreaking, uh, caught, raised a lot of hackles. But my favorite one is Underground <laughs> in 1941. And uh, and when the Harry appeared in Congress, he made the senators look like, uh, frankly, the fools that they were. You yeah, because, yeah, the senators hadn't seen any of the movies that they yeah, claimed yeah. were so dangerous. And and yeah, that's the, the my favorite part is Harry co- goes and he, he brings a letter uh, to one of the senators, Gerald Nye, and he reads it. And it's a letter from two years prior where Senator Nye, who was one of the orchestrators of this whole Senate investigation, had actually seen Confessions of a Nazi Spy, loved it, wrote to the Warners, said, it, you know, this movie made him love America. We need to make more movies like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it yeah. was uh, it was silly, but yeah, Underground. And we talked about this the other night at Edmonds too. And Underground yeah. is one movie. I think in recent years, more people have discovered Confessions of a Nazi Spy. Right, Warner Archive put it out on Blu-ray. 
Um, right. But maybe that'll be the, our, our recommendation to Warner Archive. Uh, let's yeah, do Underground. Yeah, my, Underground is yeah, a movie yeah, waiting Tim, to be Tim, rediscovered. Take Tim, take that for an action item. Uh, uh, <laughs> Warner Brothers needs to put out Underground on Blu-ray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From, from put it Chris Yogurts and Alan Rohde. <laughs> yep. Put it on the list, by the way. <laughs> Which is, yeah, add that to the list. <laughs> well, I did want to kind of go back. I know you guys have so much knowledge about this, and I just don't want to lose the listeners who maybe need to catch a, a few other points on this. But sure. I, did want to, I did want to go back a little bit to the early days. I thought there were a couple of themes that you really focus on that happened in the 20s, which is you already mentioned that uh, the, that they wanted to do, um, they felt that there was a, a real power in cinema for good, for education. And these movies mm-hmm. you're mentioning, they did all that. They were controversial, but they were they were also like social issues. You know, they were like, hey, these are the real people. This is what people are going through. And we want to show that. We want to show people back and let people know what's going on in the world. Uh, and that stemmed from, from Harry. And, and I think he, you talk about this speech he did at Harvard, where he really talked about yeah. the importance of using cinema for education. And I thought that was a theme that really is a Warner Brothers, uh, one of the key themes that I saw there. And that mixed right in, I thought, with the other ripped from the headlines, which is so important, that those two kind of really went together. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you when you look at everything Harry Warner was saying in the 20s, you see, you know, them constantly putting, you know, his money where his mouth is. And then you see this all come through in the movies. So, um, you know, he, he thought movies were, you know, he... Th- he he thought movies should mirror the world, engage with the world as it was. And, you know, their first full length sound film, right? We talk a lot about the jazz singer, the first full length sound film, it's still a pretty short movie, but lights of New York uh, is, is essentially kind of a, a, you know, an embryonic Warner brothers gangster movie. And I found a, there was a, a script girl who was, who was um, interviewed in the seventies before she died. And she, there's some anecdotes she has about that movie and how, um, you know, the, the producer, or, uh, Brian Foy, who were, was a longtime Warner Brothers employee, she had said Brian that you know, all the people on the set and, you know, it, helping inform this movie were like all actual mobsters. And she had said that like Foy had so many wow. criminal friends that these people were just kind of on the lot. And that's, you know, in, to inform, you know, make these movies feel more real. And, you know, they do the same thing with um, I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang, where you have this guy who was wrongly you know, prisoned hard time chain gang for a petty crime on the run, writes a book. They pick him up and they hide him at the Warner Brothers studio so he could inform this movie of the same title. Um, that is like probably the quintessential Great Depression movie about struggle and the impossibility of tomorrow. Uh, and they're they're so they're so attached to to getting realism that they, they bring these people in. I mean, same thing with Confession of the Nazi Spy. Jack sent people to the trial, writers to the trial, to, to listen to stuff and talk to people and get a sense of what was going on and the feelings so those could be incorporated back into a movie. So when you look at what, you know, yeah, the, the you know, Harry Warner, there was a bunch of studio big shots that gave a speech, gave, it was, it was like a course that, put together by Joseph Kennedy that, you know, all of these, you know, now by 1927, 28, we're realizing that movie industry in the United States is going to be this major global force. So let's start talking about it. So there was, you know, there's a book you can get with everybody's speeches in it, which is really fascinating. But but Harry, true to form, focused on uh, really not only pushing movies as this new interesting thing, but something that we can use to to help not only ourselves, but the world. And I think when you see the, the kinds of movies they're putting out pretty much from there after everything is is really kind of salt of the earth i mean even their musicals i know i I think alan and i were talking about the other night too right their their musicals are not mgm musicals they are they are musicals the the backstage musicals where the 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 performers and the artists are living in the same great depression as the viewers where they're like if this show isn't successful we're gonna lose our house well you know warner the warner brother warner brothers was the proletarian studio I mean, Absolutely. when you just look at the physical appearance and how James Cagney, Edward G. Robinson, Joan Blondell, I mean, those people would not have been hired at MGM. <laughs> you right. know, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, the Roaring Twenties, where Cagney gets killed at the end of the film. I don't think that would have happened to Ronald Coleman or Clark Gable. Okay, at MGM. <laughs> absolutely not. It, it would would not have happened. And and speaking about Warner's uh, uh, social commentary, I mean, they made another movie about the Edith Maxwell case in 1937 called Mountain Justice. And Edith Maxwell was a 21 year old school teacher with this horribly abusive father who used to beat her. And she ended up killing him in self-defense and was sentenced to death. And they wanted to lynch her. This is in Virginia when Virginia was rural. And of course, the Warner Brothers seized on that and said, let's make a movie about that with George Brent and Josephine Hutchinson and Michael Curtiz directing it and so forth. And that was another uh, bit of social commentary ripped from the headlines. Uh, and this was after Zanuck had left the studio in 1933. So this was, you know, this was Hal Wallace and Jack Warner continuing that even as when Zanuck left, the the emphasis shifted with Wallace making the swashbucklers, making mm -hmm. Errol Flynn a star, uh, Captain Blood, The Adventures of Robin Hood, putting more money and more grandeur into the films, uh, because I think Wallace and Jack Warner could sense that the, the, the country was starting to come out of the Depression and they wanted things to be more upbeat and more entertaining uh, than, you know, public enemy with James Cagney falling trussed up dead when his right. brother opened the front door. <laughs> right. They, they wanted a little more, a little more uplift than that. Uh, but right. And they, and they weren't averse to the, the, you know, the classier kind of pictures. I mean, even in the twenties, you know, they were the, they were the studio that brought Ernst Lubitsch to Hollywood um, and ended right. up thinking he was a little bit too much of a prima donna for the way they like to operate. But I mean, it shows you, they still had this interest in, you know, th that's the whole reason they, you know, one of their first film distribution companies called the, you know, they named it after Duquesne University because they thought, oh, this, this has some prestige. Yeah. So if we name our, our company, it's people are going to automatically assume. So they, they still, they still had their, their eyes on, you know, on that level too, on where, you know, where can we, where can we, we, we add a little prestige to our product. They're the ones that hired John Barrymore for goodness right. sakes. And right. made the Sea Beast and made Svengali, but they dropped him because his films weren't making enough money to cover his salary, you know. And and they dropped him. And and you know, let let's be honest here. Uh, Jack Warner did not like actors as a group. I mean, he really didn't. He he viewed them as necessary evils, but he tried to keep them as kind of um, you know uh, uh, indentured people who should be grateful to him right. that they made that they were they, that he turned them into stars and how dare they want to make say no to him on certain movies and that they wanted more money and where was gratitude you know and, right. and all of this and uh, i remember edward g robinson told a funny story when um, i think warner went by his house to give him the script of Ken, kid galahad and warner was kvetching over Olivia de Havilland, Betty Davis, I made them stars. Where's gratitude? And, you know, and Robinson just shook his head and said, he doesn't get it and he never will. Right. There, there was a, a strange sense of ownership. And it wasn't just the Warners, right? It was all these studios where you invest right, in making right, right. somebody a star and then you feel like you, there's right. this, we own that stardom. Uh, and that, yeah, that and, and if someone got too big for their britches or made too much money, uh, they, they, they knocked them down. And the, the, the emblematic example is what happened to Kay Francis. You know, I think by 1937, Kay Francis was making $5,000 a week. And Harry Warner, I think, realized how can this, how can this woman be making this kind of money? That's almost as much as me or more. And, uh, she had the temerity to sue Jack Warner because he had promised to cast her in, Tuverich, and instead they borrowed Claudette Colbert. And when she sued, she suddenly dropped the lawsuit. And then all of a sudden, her dressing room was taken away. Uh, she had to do uh, screen tests with, uh, with, with rookies that were brought in. And she just said, I don't care what they put me in or what they do, they're going to pay me my contract. And they made it very tough for her. And she got paid. But by the time they were done, she was no longer a movie star and she was damaged goods by the time her contract was over. So 
there was there was that side of the Warners that if you crossed them uh, and you were talent and you crossed them or your popularity ran out, like Edward G. Robinson, when they got ready to drop him, Jack Warner just said, hey, I've got a new movie for you, The Beast with Five Fingers. How do you like that? You know, and Robinson said, I'm out of here. And that made it that made it easy. So um, they were they were they could be hard hearted when they felt that uh, people were not loyal. On the other hand, they kept people around and Jack Warner very quietly kept people like Monty Blue, uh, who had been a silent star and and kept kept a lot of the old timers around and kept them employed and so on and so forth. But uh, Jack was the kind of guy he didn't he didn't want anyone to know he had any kindness in him because he felt people would take advantage of him. Right. Right. And, uh, and he, he and also wanted to be the star. Pardon? I said he also wanted to be the star. I feel like, you know, if, if oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. well, if yeah, Jack could have been singing, James Cagney, he would have. Yeah. The singing, uh, you know, he was singing on the Warner's radio station and the, the jokes. I remember Dick Erdman told me they would have all the distributors in for a big banquet and it would be on a soundstage and Jack Warner would be at the center of the dais and he would tell these terrible corny jokes. And if no one laughed, he figured they didn't hear him. So he'd tell it again in a louder tone of voice <laughs> you know? and everyone had to show up for these things. Uh, and, and that was when they played the outtakes of, of actors going dry and stuff going wrong. And they call them the the follies or the breakups. Mm-hmm. And I think there, there's a lot of those that are still available. And they would show those and they'd have a banquet and try and keep the distributors happy and so forth. But uh, yeah, Jack, I think, was a frustrated uh, uh, kind of like a broken down vaudevillian with the corny jokes and yep. all of that stuff. That was that was part of his personality, no doubt. Hey, we've talked a lot about Harry and we've talked a lot about Jack. And I think that those are the two that probably most people talk about. Um, And part of it is Sam, you know, died young. But maybe we should talk a little bit about Sam and the influence he had. And then also, we don't want to forget about Abe. Um, But I, I was, you know, I was reading the part about Sam and he really was focused on technology and helping find ways to advance. Um, And he was the biggest maybe risk taker in that sense. Um, mm-hmm. and I, I think that you have a quote in there that I, I pulled out and said, so somebody said, don't wait to find out what the audience wants. And that became something that either they learned through doing the sound or, or was a part of their thinking during that. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, and Sam was, you know, yeah, he was the one who brought the projector home, right. The story that is in all the books that, you know, that got them, but he was also, I mean, he, he found a movie that, that was, you know, they, that wasn't locked down and, um, um, Dante's Inferno. And they would, they did what it looks like was one of, or not the first roadshow movie, you know, so they would do that and they would bring in, you know, this, this drunk guy, apparently come read parts of the book and then show some of the movie, and so he was always thinking like, hey, I think if we would do this, um, because he was, Sam was also the one who worked for Hale's Tours. So he he saw some of the, the early ways to tinker with moving pictures to get people to come. Um, so he, you know, he was his mind was always, you know, not like, let me see what's popular. It's what can I create that might be the next big thing? So that was that was definitely his mentality. And that's why it never really phased him when Edison and, and other companies, you know, had been tinkering with sound forever and never really got it to work. I mean, he he lived day and night to figure out how to make sound work in bigger and bigger venues. And when they bought uh, Vitagraph in Brooklyn, he was he moved out there and he was working there and, and working on on different ways to to wire where to where to put the the wax discs where to put the projector where to uh, you know eventually he's he rents out a space uh, in New York City and he's going you know f- up you know up and down floors with wire you know trying to get everything where there's no interference of sound and where of course you know the table you start a record someone sneezes too hard close to it and now your movie's all out of sync so <laughs> He, you know, he really yeah. literally killed himself trying to find the best way to do this. And, you know, in a lot of books, it's like, oh, you know, you know, Sam, you know, cr- you know, brought the projector and then helped with the jazz singer and then died. But it's like there's this 
this huge chunk of time, years and years, where he is just really busting his ass trying to figure out how to make movies better and more engaging and, and trying to level up, you know, first with music, synchronized music, and then with dialogue. And, and he was, I mean, just, just like Harry, he thought movies could always be better, always be more important. And I think he really, he really took that to heart. Yeah. And Sam was really the, the glue that kept the brothers together, particularly Harry as the absence that's his old elder. And then Jack, who was the younger kind of clownish kid brother who was a pain in the neck when he was a kid. And Sam could bridge those gaps with both of them. And he kept, he kept the brothers as, as a team. And, and I think you made the point how hard he worked. He literally worked himself to death. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, when he died, uh, that put, that put, uh, Harry and Jack in direct conflict, but they coexisted as long as Harry stayed in New York and Jack was running the studio out here in Hollywood. But when Harry moved out here, that put him into close quarters because, uh, Jack viewed the studio as his own domain and Harry viewed himself as I'm the older brother and I can, I run the company. And right. so the conflict between those two became, as time went on, became worse and worse and worse. Right. And, and that's why and this is everybody, so- everybody on the lot knew about it. They all knew that they, the, the, that Jack and Harry hated each other. Uh, and, and of course that ended up with the betrayal with, uh, the brothers, the three brothers agreeing to sell the studio and uh, then Jack made an under the table deal to get his stock back and become the company. And I don't know, Chris, as the story goes, uh, Harry found out about it in the trade papers and it gave him a heart attack. Yep. Um, yeah. He had a heart attack from which he never recovered. He died two years later, but he was never the same. Yeah. And that's why, yeah. you know, the story has so much just incredibly heart wrenching tragedy, you know, because and that's the thing. I mean, things might have been different had Sam lived. I mean, I think Sam as far as the company had, had his impact was felt forever. But I feel like with, with the family, uh, they probably would have got along better. I mean, it's, it's, it, that's where the real tragedy is. I mean, not only to see what else Mm -hmm. Sam would have done, but I think he would have helped the family. I think everybody would have been happier. And that's why it's that much more tragic when they lose Lewis, Harry's son, because it sounds like Lewis was a lot like Sam. Everybody loved him. He was he was mm-hmm. another kind of this glue figure, like Alan said, that everybody rallied around, had confidence in. It was it was like one of the family members everyone could agree that they liked. Um, yeah, and then they lose him a few years later. So now you you know you. I don't think Harry point. was the same after that. He was never no, the and, same and, after losing his son. No, no, and yeah, neither, and, neither and, was, was his wife. Yeah. And and I guess, but for. The invention of antibiotics, both both uh, both of the both uh, uh, Sam and Harry's son would have probably recovered. For sure, for sure. It's, yeah. These are the kind of stories that make you happy. You're living now. Uh. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. It's uh, and, yeah. And it, the other thing it, is that uh, I think Sam, being one of the younger, was closer to to Jack, and I think it what? lost. Yeah. There is that Jack. Uh, lost an ally. Like he lost his yeah. best friend, I think you say in the book uh, in many ways. And so then you've got Jack and Harry with nobody in between to kind of bridge. Oh, yeah. And so oh, that, yeah. that leads to some of their, yeah, and then it, uh, there, there's some, uh, some other things that I thought were interesting about Sam. And that's the fact that he marries Le- uh, uh, Lena. Lena Basket. Right. And that's a very interesting story because I think we kind of talk, think about Sam as being, you know, kind of steady and he just focused on sound, but he actually married the most unique, right? He married outside the faith. And yeah. then he has a daughter. And that whole story is, is kind of a dark chapter. But you, I think, put a not, nice balance to it. Because yeah. Harry takes uh, Lita and raises her with his own family. But, um, yeah, it, it really yeah. changed the family in so many ways and yeah. affected them for decades to come. Right. And I think the positive right. of it was, the, was kind of focusing on the, them being risk takers and pushing oh, the yeah. Oh, yeah. and all that. Yeah, and I, and I think I think initially, like in the 20s and particularly the 30s, they were ahead of the power curve on taking risks and gambling with sound, with Technicolor. Definitely. And then 
later a little bit with 3D that was more of a fad. But by the time the 50s rolled around, they're both older. And, and it turned to more, particularly after the blacklist and the McCarthyism thing, that really shook them up where they realized the government could, could put them out of business. And uh, I think the emphasis then shifted to preserving what we, what we built rather than being innovative and something like that. And, uh, and the other thing that really drove, a, I think, the brothers apart was the fact that Jack divorced his wife, Irma, and he married outside the faith, and he married uh, Ann Warner, who was a uh, uh, divorcee. And Harry just went absolutely bonkers over that. And, you know, the fact that before Jack got divorced, he left his wife and he was squiring Ann around at all these Hollywood events <laughs> and everything. And Harry, with Harry, everything was like family, faith, business, you know, in, 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 in kind of that order. And uh, Harry, you know, Jack's attitude was, I'm a grown man. I'm not your little brother. I can do whatever I want to do, which was correct. Uh, but uh, that that whole divorce thing really drove the, the, the older and the younger brother apart. It did. You know, so we haven't talked uh, much yeah. about we haven't talked much about Abe, uh, the other brother. What was his role in the family and what are some of the things you learned in, in the research? <laughs> Abe was a tricky one, and he he was probably the the first reason I hesitated on doing all the brothers because Abe avoided the press expertly, um, <clears throat> did not give a lot of interviews, was not that accessible. I found some interviews, I and mean, even Cass Warner on her website has some family members who you know knew Abe and had some had some good stories, so that was helpful. Uh, I ended up finding a lot of stuff in like the pre nineteen twenty three where he you know he, as one of the oldest. You know, he was, you know, he took the reins with some interviews and things. So I was able to incorporate him more. But he, in the early years, just along with Harry, because they were the closest in age, um, they they were the the business leaders. They were the ones, you know, talking to the banks. And and as their company grew, Albert was the one who was focused on distribution. So a lot of, you know, a lot of places I could find quotes about him or find meetings he was at were in, in magazines and publications that were meant for distributors. And, um, and he also, I mean, just like Harry, he was hugely, uh, philanthropic and, and even before one of the favorite pictures I have in my book is not long before he died. There's a picture of him watching the groundbreaking of this hospital that he and his wife funded in Miami where he retired and lived down there. Um, so they were, you know, a lot of times, most of Albert was in the news was either for philanthropy or for awards he was given for his philanthropy. Yeah. I, I think I wrote in my book about critiques that uh, Albert or Abe had all the effervescence of an undertaker. Uh, he was he was very low key and he mm -hmm. he was very much a supporter of his older brother and very allied. Mm -hmm. In fact, when uh, Jack uh, betrayed them with the company, I think uh, from that time, Albert and Jack, never, he never spoke to Jack again after that. I don't think so. Uh, my favorite yeah. Albert story, though, is is in the days when they were still doing just distribution. They had offices in New York, and Edison's trust was still still had his attack dogs looking to shut people down. And one of Edison's thugs came into the Warner Brothers office and threatened to shut them down. But at this point, the Warners were getting a little bit bigger. I think this was as they were the Duquesne Company, or it was might have been the Warners Features Players, I, somewhere in there. Uh, and Abe stands up. Abe, who is a really big guy, stands up and threatens to throw this guy out the window. Um, and he leaves and they don't have any problems with Edison from then on. That's just, that's exactly how Burt Lancaster renegotiated his contract with Hal Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there were some other interesting stories uh, and anecdotes you, you know, you, you interspersed throughout the book. But, um, you know, one of them that I wanted to bring up is because, you know, we talked about the four brothers and it's, it's like, well, why didn't their offspring, obviously Lewis died. But well, why didn't some of the rest of their offspring get more involved? And and you know Jack Jr. maybe would have. That's really his father you not letting him. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, but there's also a, a kind of I just want to pull one small story out. And there's the story about uh, Harry's daughter Doris pitching Gone with the Wind. But she, she really, even though he maybe wanted her to take over Lewis's kind of hey be more involved with the company, she was not that interested. And the no, other no. kids, many of them were not. 
Right. Yeah, they were. Yeah, Doris. Well, Doris, who who married uh, Mervyn Leroy, right? So I mean, so she was always connected to the business. And that's what, what I love about that is, right, she pitches Gone with the Wind, but then Mervyn Leroy, her husband, ends up producing that at MGM. Um, so it, it's weird to think what Gone with the Wind would have been like as a Warner Brothers movie. Um, but but yeah, I mean, there's the, you know, there was attempts, and, and it says a lot about Harry, too, where it sounds like, I mean, Betty Warner, um, <clears throat> Harry's daughter, had thought that Doris didn't really want to deal with this kind of overbearing male dominated uh, structure of the, the, you know, the top echelon, but it does say, say a lot, which, which was true. And I can, I certainly don't blame her. I can't imagine how difficult that would have been in the thirties, but it says a lot about Harry that he, you know, that, that didn't seem to have an impact on him at all. It was just like, Oh, well, I trust my family. Let's just, whoever seems well, you know, fitted for this, let's give them a shot. Um, so that's another, you know, as Harry, as, as much as Harry was kind of old timey, and conservative on certain things, he was also very progressive on other things like that. I I think uh, Chris, you know, you talked about the the tragedy of a lot of the Warner family dynamics, and I think one one element of that tragedy that's very striking is the relationship with Jack Warner and his son Jack Warner Jr. Yeah, and and uh, what happened with that, and I think uh, as Tim pointed out, Jack Warner Jr. was working for the company, was doing things. But there was always tension between the two of them because when Jack got divorced from Irma, uh, Jack Jr. was a kid and he remained with his mother and, and Jack always felt he sided with the mother against him. So there's always that tension. And um, then there was the car accident in uh, the late 50s where Jack Warner almost died. I was in a terrible automobile accident, I think in Monaco or in the south of France, where he had his house. And I don't know what happened. I think Jack Jr. gave a press release that Jack Sr. in his uh, uh, condition felt like Jr. was going to take the studio away from him, which was preposterous. So uh, as the story goes, Jack Jr. comes to the studio one day and the gate guard won't let him in and the locks are changed on his office. And his own father not only disowned him, he just basically locked him out of his life. Well, and this uh, is where, I mean, you know, Harry is spending less great. time at the studio and, you know, Harry would always say, you know, would you know, something like this would happen. He would just call Harry and Harry would let him back on the lot. Um, but yeah. that's one of the saddest things is, you know, Jack Jr. has these stories. I think it's in Cass Warner's book about, you know, how, you know, in the before Sam dies, he kind of described Jack as this kind of skipping to work, very happy, just loved everything about his life, the business, all of this. As soon as Sam dies, mm-hmm. that all changes. And now these mm-hmm. walls are up. Um, and then that yeah. that was only compounded when he leaves Irma, right? And then, you know, and, you know, he's got mm-hmm. this son who also loves his mom. Uh, and Jack, mm-hmm. you know, feels that as, I don't know, some kind of weird betrayal, I, you know. So, yeah, it's just, it, it's just every one of these things. As soon as Sam dies, every issue within the family gets compounded by the next issue, the next issue, the next issue, which then, uh, you know, explodes in 1956 with this sale and betrayal and all of that. And it's, it's really, right. it's right. a wild story then, when you look at we, it as a whole. Yeah. And, and when Jack took over the studio in, in the last part of uh, his tenure there, uh, it was kind of interesting reading accounts of, of him working on films like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf mm-hmm. and Bonnie and Clyde and all of that. Uh, um, you know, I guess, I guess his greatest last great triumph was My Fair Lady that he personally produced that, that won Best Picture and so yeah. on and so forth. But um, uh, I think Jack uh, really befitting someone who was born in 1892 had trouble adjusting to the violence mm-hmm. in Bonnie and Clyde and the rawness of who's afraid of Virginia Woolf. Though but he did. Picture, yeah. He did. just got made and they were yep. successful. Yeah. And, you know, you're talking, you know, this, this with the, by the late fifties, early sixties, this is that weird period where like a chunk of that time, the production code is still there, but really nobody's paying attention to it anymore. And this is before we mm-hmm. have the rating system that we have today. So there was this, right. so as early as I found um, a Kazan film, baby doll, that was one that had issues with what was left of the code, but he said, well, let's just release it with an adults only stamp. Mm -hmm. Um, And they got that out there. I mean, he went to great length to defend the nun's Mm -hmm. story when the Catholic church was going to ban it. Um, He actually flew to Rome 
Um, and then with Virginia Woolf, right, even though he probably didn't understand a lot of the rawness of that movie, similarly, he did, let's do the adults only. And he defended the content of the movie, right. which is not right. a whole lot different than him, you know, defending the gangster movies in the early days, right? Like he was, right. that, that was a part of him that carried throughout, um, I think. And we can see that towards the end, but you're right. By the time we get to Bonnie and Clyde, he's no longer, he can't even do that, right? Like that, like just, you know, that was yeah. what, three or four years after Virginia Woolf. Um, maybe yeah, last I think one of the one of the last pictures he greenlit was Bullet, and because McQueen had become a big star, Jack gave him his production company offices and a salary and everything. And then Steve McQueen couldn't decide on a script for a year, and finally his McQueen's production partner said, "We got to make a movie." You know, Jack <laughs> Warner's getting antsy. We got to make a movie. So they decide to make Bullet uh, based on a book. Uh, and so uh, the producers, McQueen's producer, goes see Jack Warner. And he said in his memoir, this is emblematic how the business changed. He said, I got the picture greenlit in two minutes. He said, I went to see Jack Warner. And he says, I think we're going to make the movie uh, on this. And Warner goes, McQueen is a cop. And he goes, well, there's going to be a lot of character nuances. And then he says, good. How much? You know, eight million. When can I have it? By the end of the year? Yes. He goes, good. I want you to do one thing for you. I need you and McQueen to come sit on this dais for this political dinner I'm having. If you do that, you can make the movie. They said, fine. He said, I was in Warner's office for two minutes. There were no notes. There was no committee. There was nothing. It was Jack saying, sure, go ahead for this amount of money, deliver it here and come to dinner with me and you can make the movie. (laughs) <laughs> there was a similar story with I think I cut it out of the book as one of the readers didn't like it or thought it was just too much of a, an aside but it was um, it for uh, a, a Star is Born the Judy Garland one I, apparently right, she got right. cast in that because she agreed to sing at at Jack's daughter's birthday party <laughs> yeah yeah and didn't didn't <laughs> she drive Jack about round the bend during that movie, wasn't there a lot of, uh, you know, yeah. she was late and the movie was running over budget. Yeah, that was a tricky time in her life, too. And I think that was part of the issue, part of his hesitation yeah. to cast her because she had become, you know, it'd been, yeah. you know, some of her personal issues yeah. had started to bleed into pictures business. Yeah. Yeah. And and uh, uh, it, it was kind of interesting, the relationship between Jack Warner and some of his stars was not always contentious. He did get along with Errol Flynn mm-hmm. until Flynn's, you know, drinking and stuff in the late 40s uh, and early 50s got out of hand uh, and started costing Jack money. But I think uh, uh, Jack used to call Flynn the Baron and uh, Flynn used to call Jack sporting blood. <laughs> and uh, I remember Paul Paterni when they were making Maru Maru was sitting outside the soundstage with Flynn having a smoke break. And one of the Warner messengers comes up, hands Flynn a note, said, this is from Mr. Warner. And this note is, you've run up $2,000 worth of long distance personal phone bills. This is outrageous. You must pay it at once, Jack. (laughs) And then Flynn had the messenger hold up. And he wrote, dear Jack, I'm willing to overlook this if you are. <laughs> he wrote that and sent it back to him. <laughs> you know? So, so they, they did have that. I, I think Jack secretly admired um, Flynn's kind of outrageous dash and, you know, For sure. uh, um, the kind of kind of the way that Howard Hughes kind of wanted to be Robert Mitchum. You know, I think there was Absolutely. a little of that in Jack uh, uh, and so forth. But of course, his battles with Betty Davis, Olivia de Havilland, whose lawsuit overturned the uh, yep. pernicious practice of adding suspension time to the end of seven year contracts, which basically amounted to indenturement uh, and won that case. Uh, and his battles with Cagney, um, yep. you know, I mean, Cagney, Cagney called Jack the Swans, which I'll let the audience interpret what that means, but, uh, uh, there was, there was no, uh, love loss between uh, James Cagney and Jack. Well, and you, and you, you mentioned that, you know, Jack's treatment of actors, but you know, it was quite different with directors, right? Because he was, some of them, he was really mm-hmm. good friends with, I mean, Mervyn Leroy, right. And, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. and he spoke highly of them and he also liked to sit in the editing room with them and, you know, oh, go yeah. through dailies and all that. So, I mean, and, you know, we talk mm-hmm. about, you know, studio heads, 
really loving movies and, and understanding the process of it. I mean, he was, you know, for all of his faults, which were many, of course, he still he understood movies. He loved movies. You know, he he loved to see what was going on day to day. He loved to, you know, oh, yeah. Talk about, you know, how can we speed up these movies? I know at Edmonds, we talked about that, right? He would be in the editing room be like, you know, cut this, you know, down. So we move from this scene to this scene. You know, everything could move fast. And, uh, you know, one of one of the people that did like Jack was Jimmy Lydon, who I got to know a little bit. And I interviewed uh, for my critique book. And he he said, you know, because in the 60s, that was when. uh, um, uh Jimmy Lydon and Bill Conrad were making these movies like Two on a Guillotine, My Blood Runs Cold, and I believe they took over 77 Sunset Strip for a while. And he said Jack would come down and say, hey, kid, why don't you make this movie? Here's 300000 or whatever. And he said as long as you didn't go over budget, he was great. And later on, Jimmy was uh, one of the heads of the SAG, and I said, well, didn't Jack like refuse to pay residuals after they were negotiated and you guys had to strike Warner Brothers because he just said, I don't care what the contract says. I'm not paying for work. Not I already I only pay once for work performed. Mm-hmm. And Jimmy goes, well, it took Jack a while to get his mind wrapped around certain things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So but but Jimmy, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Lydon liked him. Uh, liked working for him because I think at that point Jack was very laissez-faire with with people working with him as long as they didn't go over budget and cost him money or cause trouble mm-hmm. or anything like that. He just let them have their head, uh, for which sure. is what filmmakers like in an executive, quite frankly. Well, guys, it's been a lot of fun, and and uh, before we wrap up, Chris, I I did want to kind of give you one last chance to kind of you know sum it up for you this experience and this book um i mean it's kind of surprising that nobody has really done what you just did but you read the book and it's it's kind of this shakespearean drama almost uh, uh of of tragedy and triumph and uh backstabbing and and uh technology i mean but one of the things that i, th- I think makes it really fascinating is that uh, warner brothers had had i think on one of their advertisements that film cinema was going to do more good for humanity than anything else ever invented. And I sure know that in my life, I mean, the impact of cinema of the the three of us is one of the most important things in our lives. And you see the impact of cinema and film uh, nationwide in terms of informing thought and informing opinion and bringing issues. I mean, it really has become what Harry envisioned and uh, and Albert and everybody. Um, But but to sum it up, kind of tell us a little bit about your experience and, and how this has been for you. Yeah, that, I mean, this book, I mean, like my last book, I mean, it was a book that I really wanted to read. And it was one of these things like, well, I guess I guess I will write it. Uh, so, you know, I, I kept seeing, you know, there's all these snippets of these stories in, in other books and stuff that have you know different focuses. So I wanted I wanted to see all of this in one place um, while also you know, giving, giving due to Sam and Jack and Albert to the extent that I could, or uh, Harry rather, and Albert, Jack has, has gotten plenty. But it, I also, I mean, with, with Jack, I, I, I thought I was going to find out way more dirt. What I realized is we kind of know all of it already. And there's, there was this other human side to Jack that he tried to keep, like Alan said earlier, tried to keep very quiet. And, you know, as long as you weren't a family member, or one of his, you know, quote unquote, overpaid actors, he could have he could be really nice person. And he, he treated some people really well. So that, you know, yeah. that kind of that further complicates this whole narrative. Right. And it, w- it was fun to see, you know, what what was true and what was maybe a little bit of a stretch. Most of the stretches are things that were in Jack's memoir. Um, but also, you know, put it, give, giving Harry his due and, and, um, some of the incredible things he did and, you know, trying to fund, you know, relocating all of the displaced citizens in Europe after World War II and telling Truman he would fund it. I mean, just these incredible stories that are not even movie stories, uh, that, um, it, it's just, it's almost unbelievable, but to, you know, try to put it all in oh. one spot. I just, you know, I wanted to learn all of it and now I want everyone else to see all of it because it's just, it's an incredible story. Uh, and it has literally everything you might want from, uh, a, a, a book about movie history, but also a book just about history. 
because the brothers were engaged with world leaders, um, especially Harry Jack tried to do that more later on in life. Uh, but they were they were p- probably more plugged into the world than than anybody else in Hollywood. And it was just it's absolutely to me, it's fascinating. I hope it is to everybody else, too. Yeah, I think I think the 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 um, Chris's story about the Warner Brothers, it's more than movie history and it's more than a Shakespearean family drama. It's uh, it's part of the history of America in the 20th century. Uh, it really, really is. And it's a great book. And uh, one of the things about Jack uh, that I think we should point out in, in, a, in an era where women were treated abominably, uh, and particularly in our present era of, of uh, coming to grips with uh, Me Too and, and all of this, uh, as Betty Davis once said, I believe on the Merv Griffin show or Dick Cavett, she said, Mr. Warner didn't fool around with the help. He, he, he did not, he, he had his dalliances, but they were not with act. They were not with actresses and people who worked at the studio or people, they were not, they were not that way because he it was not a casting couch studio. It was at not, all. He was not a casting couch uh, guy. He, I believe he did have a fling with Marilyn Miller, like in 1930, who was a big Broadway star who was under contract to Warner brothers briefly. That, that sent Harry's blood pressure through the roof. But beyond that, he, uh, Jack was very circumspect about uh, that, that type of stuff. And when you look, I mean, they called Betty Davis the fourth Warner Brothers. Uh, I think that was exaggerated, but they did that for a reason, because mm-hmm. he respected her and respected her box office power, her acumen, her moxie. And I think Jack was a guy that if you had talent, and you could stand up to him successfully with a reason. I think he respected that uh, to Definitely. a certain degree. So I, I think I think Chris's book is wonderful because he's brought a real American story to life. And and for me, looking back, Warner Brothers is the American movie studio uh, uh, through and through. Uh, the pictures that they made. Uh, I mean, I think. When we're long gone, people will still be watching The Adventures of Robin Hood because there's right. a movie that doesn't date, you know, and a lot of the movies that were made at Warner Brothers still hold up really, really well. And I don't think you can say the same thing for some of the other studios. And I'm not putting somebody down to raise Warner Brothers up, but I just think that that's true. For sure. Yeah. A lot of other, you know, when you love old movies, you can love old movies that are outdated um, because you can see them Mm -hmm. through the lens of their time. But yeah, you're right. There's something about Warner Brothers where they were just they were on the on the pulse of something truly timeless with so many of their movies. And um, I I like how you phrase that, too. I mean, I should have had, you know, an American movie studio is like the subtitle of my book because it really is. Yeah, there's something about Warner Brothers that is so encapsulating and different from everybody else in Hollywood at the time. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. And, and you, Chris, uh, it was great to have you talk uh, about your new book. But Alan, it was great to also get your insight because of your book on Michael Curtiz. You know so much about the studio and the actual films and to get your input. Yeah. So I really appreciate, well, I appreciate the two it. It was, uh, it was fun to be with you both. Yeah. Yeah. yeah this, was, really this was a blast. Thank you so much. Well, that was a real treat to have Chris and Alan on to talk about the Warner Brothers. I could listen to them talk for hours. Uh, They just have so much knowledge about the studio and all of the great classic films that we all know and love. There are links in the podcast show notes for those who would like to purchase the books we discussed and on our website at www.theextras.tv. So be sure and check those out. If this is the first episode of The Extras you've listened to and you enjoyed it, Please think about following the show at your favorite podcast provider. If you're on social media, be sure and follow the show on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter so that you can stay up to date on our upcoming guests and to be part of our community. And you're invited to a new Facebook group for fans of Warner Brothers films called the Warner Archive and Warner Brothers Catalog Group. So look for that link on the Facebook page or in the podcast show notes. And for our long-term listeners, don't forget to follow and leave us a review at iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider. Until next time, you've been listening to Tim Millard. Stay slightly obsessed.